Welcome everybody to Answers News for Monday, September 27th of 2021. We've got a wonderful studio audience here with us in Legacy Hall at the Creation Museum. You guys can clap and let everybody know you're here. (laughs) All right. It is a beautiful sunny day here in Kentucky. I got to enjoy some disc golf with my wife and a friend yesterday. You guys get to do anything fun this weekend? I did a little baseball. I figured you were going to say baseball. (laughs) I don't even know what. (laughs) Yeah, so we had had a good time this weekend, but it was a busy weekend. All right. I'm Roger Patterson, joined today by Bodie Hodge. We're going to be looking through some news items for you. But we've got some other great things that are happening here at the ministry. Coming up this next week, we have our Raising Godly Generations Conference. This is our Answers for Pastors Conference, Pastors and Christian Leaders. So we'll be featuring a lot of speakers who will be uh, helping leaders focus on how we uh, teach our children and raise up the next generation to be caring right. on you know, a Christian at, legacy. At a conference like this, we end up with a lot of just families, a lot of people are Sunday school teachers. You know, it's not just limited to pastors. So we see a lot of people come through, and uh, this is going to be an exciting one. I'm actually emceeing the event, so I'm going to be there for the majority of the time. And uh, we got some uh, pretty neat stuff going on. Now, you're just, like, announcing speakers. You're not bringing your record player and scratch in. No, and, no, uh, no. I, okay. just, I, I don't do the record no player thing. Week. Just, <laughs> just announcing. So, yeah, right. we'll, uh, Part of that event, uh, you've probably seen this, an exciting announcement. The 10th anniversary edition of Courageous, called Courageous Legacy, is going to be played there. There's a red carpet event. There's still time to register for that. You can find more uh, information for that by going to godlygenerations.org and looking for that. And there'll be the cast of the movie, Courageous, will be on hand for a red carpet event, uh, taking photos and doing those things. The film will be premiered and are played, and then they'll have an alternate ending that'll show up there uh, to uh, capture some of the legacy of what's happened with these families after that. So great opportunity to come and enjoy. And this uh, is held at the Ark Encounter. At the Ark Encounter. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have a big answer center there. It's uh, it's, it's going to be fascinating. So I want to encourage you guys. How many of you guys have already been to the Ark Encounter? All right. The rest of you need to get there tomorrow, right? You're headed there. Yeah, okay, okay. (laughs) We thought so. And all the people out there in the virtual world. We got to go. We got to get there. They're planning it. All right. Our fun fluff article today comes to us from Live Science. Kids' fossilized handprints may be some of the world's oldest art. Now, we've both got kids. Yes. Okay? We, we all know how they come back from a Sunday school class or kindergarten class. They've got their little handprint art where yep. they make little smudgies all over the paper. And you say, oh, that's so cute and so wonderful. So here we have something like that <laughs> from a cave right. where we have travertine, which is a type of stone that's made from uh, a mud-based uh, product that these right, once kids it dries have out, it stuck hardened. their hands into, and it's dried out and hardened into stone. And this is being considered by some as the first art. Now, I don't think they had refrigerators to stick this up on. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> Mom, look what I these, did. <laughs> they've got these handprints. Yeah, they got handprints. Looks like some footprints and all mm-hmm. sorts of little things that they're doing on here. Uh, just having a heyday with it. So it, it might be art. It may not be. We simply don't know. We do have a record, obviously, the the handprints. You know, kids do that in concrete when you when you do that. Uh, so I've done that when I was a kid as well, but yeah. I don't know if I would consider that art necessarily. Yeah. So if we think about art, there's probably some intention there. You're trying to design something, come up with a pattern. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't know the intent of this. This could have just been some kids slapping their hands in the mud and thinking it made a cool pattern. <laughs> yeah. But we definitely have some some perver- preserved specimens here. And they've tried to date these specimens using uranium, a radio- radioactive element, and they've put it somewhere between 169,000 to 226,000 years ago, uh, making it by far older than the uh, previous oldest record art, which is only in the tens of thousands of year range. Right. Now, yeah, this blows away out in the secular world by their own dating, you know, what this would be. Now, we don't agree with these dates. There's problems with these dates. You know, uh, God created everything in six days, rested on the seventh, and that was just a matter of thousands of years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, nothing like the 200,000 year date that they're trying to throw on some of this stuff. So, you know, automatically I see those dates and I think imaginary time. They don't have it right. They're trying to look at it from a secular humanistic viewpoint, which is a different religion. And uh, so, you know, of course, they they get the date back and this becomes a huge news item where really this was something that's post-Babylon. Because previously they would think it was more like 45,000 years ago at the El Castillo Cave Mm -hmm. in Spain where they have the oldest art preserved. But here we've got this. So basically... Uh, we have a limestone handprint preserved 
So if you think of parents who want to go do this, uh, we have uh, plaster of Paris, yep. and you stick Beautiful. your hand in some plaster of Paris. You're basically making limestone, same, same type of thing. <laughs> same type of principle. Uh, but warning, never stick your hand and leave it in plaster of Paris. It gets hot. There's an exothermic reaction going on there. Stick your hand in, <laughs> take it out. You don't want to get those chemical burns from yeah. that. And uh, you can make your own art using some fun things like this. And maybe some archaeologist will yeah. uncover it someday, and it'll be the millionth oldest piece of art ever made. <laughs> <laughs> now, this was actually found really high. This is up on the Tibetan uh, Plateau mm -hmm. uh, over in, you know, the, the China area. You know, think the Himalayas. Way yeah. This is really high. This is over 13,000 feet high uh, where they found this. And it, it's interesting, you know, they find fossils and all sorts of things like that. So, you know, we automatically need to think of the flood uh, with things like that. And then we see the mountain us uplift, you know, as a result uh, of the flood. I've actually been down to Peru and I've been down to the Andes Mountains there. I've been over two miles high. You know, we were finding all sorts of fossils and things like that from the flood of Noah's day. Of course, these impressions are after the flood. It yeah. is after Babel as people are spreading around and they come across this mud and do that. So from a time frame... Uh, that's where it's placed biblically. Yeah, so still pretty cool to think some young kids at the dispersion after Babel were here in this area and left these prints. So a mark of humanity we can connect back to that period. Sure is. All right, our next story from Science Daily. Plants evolved complexity in two bursts with a 250 million year hiatus. So uh, scientists in the evolutionary community have been trying to understand how plants evolved. Now, when I was studying evolutionary biology, I was actually trained, uh, did a lot of study in botany. I wrote papers on uh, evolutionary um, structures in plants and how those things had evolved over time. And there was always this big mystery of how did seeds form and then flowers form? What were the structures that changed one thing into another over time and what were the genetics involved there? So here, what these researchers have done is they've tried to kind of simplify the approach and just look at the flower parts and look at them in the in arrangement with the fossil record and their their time scale of course in evolutionary time and say what are the parts that were present in these different groups over time and how long were they in these different states and what they've concluded is that the ferns and mosses those things that we would think of as very simple plants that have simple seeds and uh, they were very early on and then they, were, they formed their seed structures, and then there was this 250 million year pause. That's often referred Where nothing to as really stasis. Happened. Yeah, not a lot of change in that yeah, period. Yeah, okay, let me explain stasis for a moment. Because in an evolutionary worldview, they have things changing almost continuously all the time. Well, when you don't see that change in the fossil record, they call that stasis. Basically, it stayed the same, but for some reason they argue that's also an argument for evolution. So when you then, don't see evolution, it's an argument for evolution. Yeah, so then there must have been some <laughs> rapid jump that caused mm -hmm. flowers to form. So they link this to animals coming on the scene and taking on uh, the land, roles in the land, so different animals forming those new roles on land, and so plants had different pollinators and those types of things to interact with them. So 250 million years later, around 100 to, uh, to 66 million years ago, you start to see flowering plants arriving on the scene with all of their... Uh, interesting petals and, and other structures that form with fruits and those types of things. So in other words, everything we ever knew about plant evolution, you got to throw it out and they start it over. Well, the sequence is still basically the, sequence, the same, yeah, okay. but now we've got some very interesting with big differences in the timing like and how that how that. Okay, changing. so once again, the time is way off. I mean, this is all flood sediment that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so if you think that's about 4,350 years ago, the flood of Noah's day buries... Uh, you know, when you find fossils very low in the fossil record, up uh, pretty high, actually, that's considered flood rock. So those were laid down at the same time. These were actually laid down probably just a little bit earlier than, say, dinosaurs and some of the other stuff that's buried above it. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, this is a record of the flood. But it still is a very interesting question for us as biblical mm -hmm. creationists. Why do we see what we would think of as more simple plants lower and the flowering plants up higher? Why don't we see more of a mixing of those things in the flood? That's a real question really that we is. have to answer. It's a challenge for yeah. us to try to think through those things. Now, they found pollen, though, much yeah. lower than pollen what Pollen is the big question mark and the big enigma in the evolutionary scale because pollen grains have been found way back mm -hmm. um, hundreds of millions of years earlier than the flowering plants. So how do they explain that? Right. Well, that means me, that the flowers were definitely there. There must have just... been flowers there if we've got <laughs> pollen from flowering plants there. 
but they'll reject that as evidence mm -hmm. because they don't find the first flower petals and the leaves and those other structures until later. So they'll insist, oh, that was contamination of some sort and other things. So uh, we've really got to look closely at that and examine those things. But as so we look at these things from a biblical yeah. perspective, all of these plants, whether they're ferns and mosses and mm -hmm. whether they're gymnosperms or angiosperms, they're all created on the same day of creation. That's right, day, day three. three. Mm -hmm. They were made on the third day. They're buried in the flood. We've got them since the flood. It's just fascinating, <laughs> you know, when we look at this. From a biblical viewpoint, this is neat research. The dates are just way off the mark. Uh, so it is kind of interesting to, to, to look at that. <clears throat> All right, we've got people so, checking in here on, yeah, I'm seeing uh, people from on all the IG over the place. page. We've got people checking in from yep. Michigan. Hello, Della, there. <laughs> and uh, as we, we look, moving on here, we've got our next article looking at when did God create Adam and Eve? So we see this question pop up here, let's a ask, lot. Let's ask the audience and see. If they, what day was Adam and Eve created? Day six, they got it. Okay. They're all over this. All right. I'm well, impressed. All right, let's move on to the next one. <laughs> okay, let's talk about it a little bit. So this, this is a, a Lutheran pastor, and his name is Dan Delzell, and he is trying to promote an idea that's very interesting and has been promoted a lot. He's linking his ideas to William Lane Craig and trying to uh, kind of promote some of Craig's views and, right. and link Although he things. disagrees with him on Although things, he's, but... he's pointing out some disagreements. So he's basically saying that, uh, and he's wrote some other, has written some other articles on this dealing with the age of the earth. He's saying that we can know that Adam was created about 6,000 years ago. And he right. does that based on the genealogies. Right, and that's good. Uh, you know, if you just uh, take a look, uh, you know, Jesus lived about 2,000 years ago. Now yeah. we have lineages from Jesus going all the way back to Adam, actually. But just as a, a marker in between there from Jesus back to Abraham, you have about 2,000 years. And then from Abraham back to Adam, you have about 2,000 years. Wait, that sounds pretty simple. So 2,000 years from Jesus to Yep, plus 2,000 years. 2,000 years to Jesus to Abraham, mm -hmm. plus 2,000 years, 2 plus 2 plus 2 is... About 6,000 Six, years. About 6,000 years. And, you know, hosts of different chronologists, Christians and Jews, have tallied this up. I've even added it up. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you get dates right there around that, that time frame, about 4,000 years between uh, Jesus and Adam. So yeah. uh, it, it actually makes a lot of sense. So yeah. why is it that he says, while the Bible does not reveal the mysterious age of the earth? Well, it sounds pretty simple. It's <laughs> 6,000 years, give or take, plus six days, six because days. Adam was created six days later. Yeah. So what he's trying to propose is that there's some mysterious age of the earth here. So there must be some gap in Genesis 1 that doesn't allow us to understand the age of the earth. Now, this gap theory is only necessary if we try and accommodate ideas like the Big Bang, which proposes the universe is billions of years old and the earth mm -hmm. itself is over 4 billion years old. And that's an idea that William Lane Craig wholeheartedly endorses. Right. Now, this gentleman says, William Lane Craig has been on a quest to discover the historical Adam. Craig is a winsome ambassador for the Christian faith. He demonstrates tremendous kindness and, and grace as, an, as he engages believers and skeptics alike in a wide range of philosophical and theological discussions. But I'd like to hit pause right there yeah. because as, as much as that might be the claim, William Lane Craig has openly said that young earth creationism is an embarrassment. So he's called my beliefs as a Christian, mm -hmm. young earth creationist, believing in that so view. So if you hold a biblical creation, you're an embarrassment, really. Yeah. Yep. So I don't think that's exactly <laughs> kindness and grace. And to be fair, as a ministry, we've, we've held the view of a agreeing with billions of years, a compromised view because it's taking it what science, the um, secular scientific world holds and yeah. trying to blend it with the Bible. So we say that's a type of compromise. But we want to be open with that and, and be clear about what we're saying. We don't think these things agree. We think that's taking the world's view above the Bible's view first. That's really what it is. Man's ideas are being elevated to supersede God and his word. And therefore, you then go into the Bible and try to reinterpret it. So mm -hmm. basically... Uh, if I can say it that way, man's ideas have superseded God. Man becomes God in that type of an instance. And that's where you have to be very careful. God and his word, he is the absolute authority in all matters. How many of you have ever read through Genesis 1 and thought by the time you got to verse 6, <laughs> wow, there must have been billions of years already. Right. 
and it, Big Bang. It just doesn't make and, sense, but that's what yeah. this gentleman is proposing. Yeah. Um, now, if you'd like to understand more about how all these things fit together, in our mm -hmm. New Answers book two, uh, which is a great resource, one of the chapters in here deals with those genealogies. And uh, while we would agree with this gentleman's assessment in this article, that these are chrono genealogies, they have right. time markers that help us get that time from, mm -hmm. uh, from Adam up to Abraham very clearly. Uh, you can read more about that and why we believe William Lane Craig and his idea that Adam lived 400,000 years ago is very <laughs> wrong. But uh, to disagree with this gentleman and understand those ideas about how <laughs> geologic and cosmological evolution are also forms of evolution that he's embracing, I've got a chapter in How Do We Know the Bible is True called What About Theistic Evolution? And that information will help you see how there's a blending of man's ideas about right. the origin of the universe with the biblical views and how we really need to stick to what the Bible says and trust the Bible. Right. Now, from this the is very volume two in both yes. of these instances. We do have obviously volume one. With the answers books, we have four volumes. Four volumes of that. Uh, in the very first volume we, uh, of the answers book, we have a chapter that deals with the gap theory, mm -hmm. which is kind of what this author is promoting. Now, one thing he says in here, you know, he's, he's talking about uh, William Lane Craig here. And he says, uh, for example, Craig says, I think the creation of Eve out of Adam's rib is almost undeniably figurative language. And God creating Adam out of dirt and then blowing into his nose seems to be figurative as well. Now, it's interesting. I, I read a comment like that. I'm like, well, how did Jesus or how did the other Bible authors take this? Did they take it as though it was figurative? No, not at all. Um, in fact, if you look at Ecclesiastes 3.20, it talks about all of us coming from dust, and we're all going to return to dust. Mm -hmm. uh, we also see that in Ecclesiastes 12.7, or even Paul in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians uh, 15.47 through 49, for, you know, Adam was made from dust. They were taking that as though it was actual history. Yeah, but the term Craig uses for that mm -hmm. is mytho-history. He right. wants us to believe this is a myth that has some historical value to it. So, for example, when Jesus talks about Jonah being the sign of his resurrection, he didn't, Jesus might have been mistaken about Jonah. So, there are actually some real huge problems that yeah. come up with uh, this. It, it almost sounds like Jesus was telling a lie or Jesus was ignorant about those mm -hmm. things. Now, if Jesus is God, he's God, the God man, and, God and in sinless. the flesh, and <laughs> sinless, either one of those situations creates a real problem. And Craig's theology creates some real problems in that sense we as know, well. In uh, uh, Matthew chapter 19 and Mark chapter 10, uh, you know, Jesus was asked about divorce, which concerns marriage. Mm -hmm. And Jesus went back and he quoted Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 as literal history as the basis for the doctrine of marriage. And he went so far as to say, you know, at the beginning of creation, God made the male and female. But Craig has said mm -hmm. that wasn't the beginning yeah. It was six days later, but he wants <laughs> you to believe there were billions of years in wrapped up that. into that space. Right, so we have to be very careful of this. Anytime people buy into Big Bang, when they buy into millions of years, these evolutionary types of ideas, I want you to realize this isn't a new idea that's floating around out there. This is an ancient idea. I don't know if you remember, when, when Paul went to Greece, he encountered all sorts of different philosophical systems. You know, there were people who believed in a, a multitude of gods. There were the Stoics. There were the Epicureans. And sometimes you read those names, you're like, I don't know anything about those people. But the Epicureans were actually the first evolutionists of the day. They believed everything evolved from very tiny particles called atoms. That's where we get our modern word, atom. And so Paul's sitting here arguing against them, going, no, no, no. God created everything. We're all from one blood and so forth. So Paul's actually arguing against an evolutionist 2,000 years ago, and yet here we have Christians that are now buying into some of these Epicurean, rehashed Epicurean ideas and trying to impose it on the church. Yeah, so let's stick to the Bible and yep. make that our starting That's point. That's the key. If we don't know that already, we've got to get back to the Bible from the first verse. All right, moving on to the next article from Science Daily again. Extreme volcanism did not cause the massive extinction of species in the late Cretaceous. So this deals with what we think of as the uh, large asteroid impact that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs some 66 million years ago. Have you guys heard that? Time scale. You know, people saying an asteroid mm -hmm. came in and struck down there off the Yucatan yeah. and basically kills all the dinosaurs. Yep, the Chicxulub crater. Yep. So the alternate idea is there's this massive area in India called the Deccan Traps, and there's this huge release of volcanic rock, uh, magma that's flowed out into this area. And this rock layer would have released lots of gas and ash and other things in the atmosphere that would have caused lots of um, 
toxic vapors in the atmosphere mm -hmm. that could have affected life on Earth as well as uh, those greenhouse gases that affect the climate and clouding of the atmosphere with ash mm -hmm. and things. So there, there's this question mark, how would this large-scale volcanic event have affected life on Earth? Could this have been a major part of causing that extinction of the dinosaurs? Now, this is, of course, from the evolutionary perspective. So as they're trying to uh, tackle these hypotheses from a scientific perspective, they're doing their due diligence and trying to analyze these ideas. So these researchers have tried to come up with a way to uh, validate or invalidate these other hypotheses, and they're examining these different uh, layers that they found and looking at uh, rhythmites, the, the way that these different sedimentary layers are laid down and deposited and dating them, and trying to understand how the climate changed during these periods yeah. of volcanic flow and this impact crater, and what was their basic conclusion here? Well, what they ended up coming up with was saying, well, all this volcanism from the Deccan traps and so forth was not enough to do what they thought it could have done for the dinosaurs and wipe those out. So they're still saying, okay, it was the impact that did it, that really wiped out the dinosaurs. This might have contributed to some things, but um, not really uh, the basis for why things like dinosaurs have gone extinct. Now, as I read through this article, though, over and over again, when there is a date, you know, they throw a date in here 66 million years ago, 66 to 65 million years ago, 115 to 50 million years ago. I mean, they're throwing dates out here left, right, and center. Now, as soon as I see that, I go, hold on, a pr there, there's a problem with a lot of these dating systems. Obviously, you know, when we think of the Bible, we're looking at flood sediment once again. Yes. Uh, and they're trying to separate these things out by millions and millions of years. And then people want to say things like the uranium dating or potassium argon. There's all these different dating methods. But all these dating methods have the same problems. They have assumptions behind them that you can get almost any date you want at almost any time that you want. Mm -hmm. So let's say I'm going to date something. Let's say I got my fancy dragon mug here. Everybody likes my dragon. You can actually buy these. <laughs> but let's say I want to date this thing, right? I can go in there and check for a radiometric material that might be in there, and I can measure how much is in there right now, okay? But how much was in there originally? We don't know. We'd have to assume, We'd have to that assume we started out with a certain amount. With a certain amount, that's right. Now, has the rate changed at any times? You know, so a lot of radiometric dating methods change. You submit, submerge them in water. That actually affects it and so forth. Um, has there been any radioactive material added to this or taken away since this was made? Mm -hmm. That also affects your date. So there's a lot of assumptions, and people don't always realize that. But what they're doing is they've got a storyline. They try to get a date. They put the assumptions in to fit within their story. Sure. And they're linking multiple systems together here mm -hmm. where they're looking at uh, these deposition of sedimentary layers and how the um, orbit of the Earth and mm -hmm. the tilt of the axis has changed with respect to the Milankovitch cycles. <laughs> that they assume are, are switching on these very regular patterns over hundreds of thousands of years. Now, has anybody been around to observe those things for hundreds of thousands of years? Nope. No. So these are not based on observations. This is based on an interpretation of what we're observing in the present about the past. So then we're taking an interpretation about the present, assuming that it's true, and building our assumptions again. Can you guys based tell he has things. a science program? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so all weird. of these things become a chain of assumptions. And if one of those right. links in that chain is wrong, then all of the all right. of it falls. And so we have to be very aware of those types of things. Mm -hmm. Now we can we can um, commend them as scientists. They're trying to validate or invalidate their various right. hypotheses that they put forward. But if they're starting from the wrong starting point, mm -hmm. they're always going to fall flat on those right. things. Well, if you guys want to know more about some of the radiometric dating methods, this uh, volume two of our answers book, volume one in particular, has a couple of different chapters on it. Uh, yes. One about carbon dating, one about other radiometric dating methods, mm -hmm. but uh, absolutely uh, wonderful chapters to get a good understanding of that. And most laymen can read those and and understand the gist of the problems with that. Yep. All right, an interesting story here uh, coming out of uh, Morocco. Bone discovery suggests humans were already manufacturing clothes 120,000 years ago. So they're so this, making handprints before that. Yeah. And now they're they're now growing we've clothes. Got clothes before then as well. All right, so here we have a, a bunch of bone fragments that have been found in this cave in Morocco. 
I believe it would be pronounced Contrabandir's Cave in Morocco. So they've extracted 12,000 bone fragments, and at least 60 of them have been shaped for use as tools. And some of those tools seem to be used for scraping leather. Now, if you've ever um, harvested an animal or used any type of hides to make leather, you know you've got to scrape off those scrape tissues that are on there, the muscles the and the fibers. Yeah. You've got to get those things down to that bare skin layer so that they can be processed and make good quality leather. And so it seems that these tools were indeed used for that. And so very reasonable uh, research here done. But again, we deal with that issue of dating. So the we've dates, got these, these bones those dates. that are supposed to be 120,000 years old. But from a biblical time scale, we certainly can't accept that. So we have right. these layers. Now, we know these layers are close to the surface of the earth. So does that put them before the flood or after the flood? They've got to be yeah, after it, the flood. Yeah, it would flood. be after the flood. Yeah, I mean, they're finding these in a cave. I mean, a lot of these caves were formed during the flood, actually. Some of it's post-flood and so forth. But, yeah, they, they find these animal bones in there, which I think they found uh, 12,000 bone fragments, 60 different animals at least. And, you know, so, I mean, th this is a post-flood event. So this is people after the flood, after the events at the Tower of Babel, as they're spreading around to different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the things that we know about uh, Morocco and that, that particular area is a lot of Noah's uh, grandson put... Mm -hmm. A lot of his descendants settled in that particular area. So it's possible that these are Putites. It's, it's possible as another group that happened to be going through there. But this, the, these are people who are descendants of Noah. So there's no way this goes back 120,000 years. So they got the dates wrong again. Yeah, so from the evolutionary perspective, they're looking at this. Now, I think this would be a really cool job. Uh, the article <laughs> says, but it's worth noting the evidence isn't totally conclusive. These bone tools could have been used to prepare leather for purposes other than clothing, such as storage devices. And then in another spot, mm -hmm. studies of these clothing, um, sorry, to add weight to this, genetic studies of clothing lice by others suggest an origin for clothing of at least 170,000 years ago in Africa. Wouldn't that be really cool? We could study clothing lice and their genetics <laughs> and figure out that 170,000 years ago, anybody volunteer study lice? <laughs> No, come on. <laughs> right. So out of this out of Africa model of evolution would say that clothing developed 170,000 years ago. But we know the true origin of clothing because we have it recorded for us in scripture. Correct. In Genesis chapter 3, we know that Adam and Eve chose to sin against God mm -hmm. and as a result of that they realized that they were naked and that brought that shame of their nakedness. They tried to cover with fig leaves. They tried to sew their own clothing of fig have, leaves. Have you guys ever felt a fig leaf? It's kind of like itchweed. <laughs> it's not, not a good thing to use for clothes. It goes to show they were in a hurry to cover themselves mm -hmm. up. So they sewed, these, they sewed these coverings for themselves, and as God approached them and confronted them, that covering was not sufficient. And that was revealed when... Uh, God said, that's not going to work. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. And this is a real uh, interesting picture of the gospel here. Because as we think about this, it's not our own work, our own deeds that are going to cover up and, and pay for our sins. It has to be a sacrifice given to us from God. Mm -hmm. And as God clothed them with skins, where did he get those skins? Right, he sacrificed animals. They had to, to come from an animal to get those skins. And that's just a covering for sin. That's not really enough mm -hmm. to satisfy God's wrath upon sin. What we yeah. needed was an ultimate sacrifice. And that was a foreshadowing of the Lamb of God who would come to take away the sins of the world mm -hmm. in Jesus Christ. And if you've been through the creation walk here at the museum, you've seen that display of the sacrifice of those, those lambs to cover sin. So here we have a, an example of the gospel and, and when we think about why do we wear clothing, okay, we have an article like this as we interact with our neighbors and our friends. I'm glad you're wearing clothes, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Definitely. glad you guys are too. <laughs> right. as, we, as we interact with these things, here's a, here's a segue into the gospel, okay, a way to point people to it, who Christ is. It sure is. Just and by thinking about clothing. And when we see articles like this that try to undermine biblical authority, that's, that's trying to undermine the gospel. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes you need to read these articles going, hey, hold on, let's be a little more discerning on this. Hey, there might have some good information that was found, some, some fascinating artifacts, but let's think biblically about this. Because if you don't, you might get led away mm -hmm. into some of these stories yeah. that once again undermines the gospel. It's sin. It's sin that, need, that brought the need for clothing in the first place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
All right, our next story, PA Teachers Union is promoting a patently racist training course which says public education won't be fair until school systems limit the power of white parents. And come with me and let's dive into this. So here we have another article from Not The Bee. Now this is a very extensive article. We're it not is. gonna it's spend a lot of time <laughs> dealing oh. with this. But big picture, look at these things. Uh, we have another instance where a uh, school board, uh, here a union, we've seen it in school boards and other yeah. cases, they're promoting these um, really racist attitudes and trying to get us to believe that white people are the problem. When indeed, that's not the issue. The issue is that we're all sinful at heart. It's not our skin color, right. it's our sin color. And that color is always black because our hearts are dark. Our hearts are dark and stained with sin. Right, and, and you know, when you start with the Bible, we all go back to Adam and Eve, there's one race, the human race. The problem is we've been conditioned to separate people out into different groups and different higher and lower races. That actually comes mm -hmm. out of an evolutionary worldview. What we need to do is step back and go, hold on. Every person out there, regardless of your skin shade, your eye shape, we are all related. We are all one family. Yes, we have these variations, and it's a beautiful thing. It's a, I'm glad you guys don't all look like me. I mean, come on. Uh, but it, it's a beautiful thing to have this type of variation. Yeah, so it's another way to, that God has shown diversity yes. in his creation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know what? When we start looking at other people like you're our relative, and guess what? You're a sinner, and you're in need of Jesus Christ just like I am. Guess what? We start uh, treating people a little bit different as well. Yeah. And are there individuals and are there groups of people who have been involved in things that we would call racist in our society or sinful attitudes of ethnic prejudice? Absolutely. Absolutely yeah. And where those are present, present, we must repent of those things right. and move forward uh, looking toward equality. That's right. Do you think um, we have time to hit one more? Yeah, let's hit this one last article or right. one more here. Mars had liquid water on its surface. Here's why scientists think it vanished. The bottom line here is scientists have been analyzing this. Now, in the past, you may have heard Mars was covered with an ocean of water, and that's what le left behind a lot of these canyons and other formations that we see. Yeah. But now that they've examined it a little closer, these new scientists are saying it probably wasn't the case because Mars is too small, and because of that small size, its gravity isn't st strong enough to, to hold, really hold the volatile substances like water. And so it might have had some small amounts of water that could have intermittently carved some small canyons and, and those types of but things. But then has lost it. But it's lost it. Those yeah, things have just enough, yeah. gone off into space and they're floating around in space. Right, now. and of course our dates are off. 200 million, 4 oh, billion Of course, years. we see I all mean, that. Over uh, and over again. So they're, they're looking at the evidence of Martian meteorites that have come to Earth and using those as evidence ranging from, like, like mm -hmm. he said, 200 billion to 4 billion years ago and they're trying to understand the amount of water. So this isn't direct evidence from Mars. What, why, why is everybody always looking for water? Well, the bottom line here they come to is <laughs> as we're looking at all these other planets and trying to find exoplanets that have life on them, this would help them rule out the smaller size planets right. that wouldn't have enough atmosphere to be able to right. maintain water. So one of the researchers admitted this would rule out a large chunk of those planets that they're considering as possible candidates for right. life on other exoplanets because right. they would be just too small to be able to hold that water on their surface and, and then have life evolve on them. All right, let me tell you about a couple of books here as we go to close. Uh, these are uh, Galapagos Islands, A Different View, and Grand Canyon, A Different View. These are actually multi-author books. They are absolutely gorgeous books. They have a number of different scientists and authors that are in here writing, um, giving you a biblical understanding. Galapagos, that's where Darwin went and really promoted an evolutionary worldview. So, you know, you see a lot of unique diversity there. And, you know, I know we were talking about diversity of, of ant plants and animals and so forth in here. Uh, Grand Canyon, a different view, really looks at a lot of the geology of the canyon. I've actually floated down it, as well as other canyons around the world and the rock layers. Uh, absolutely gorgeous books. Uh, so I want to encourage you to take a look at those. Those are easy to read, fun uh, to, to go through. And uh, really, they're, they're great family books, in my opinion. Yeah, great conversation starters mm -hmm. to leave on your coffee table or, yep. or if you've got an office space, yeah. those types of things. Mm -hmm. But those are amazing resources to help get you back to a biblical uh, understanding of some of these issues. But I think we're out of time, and uh, we wish you uh, all the best. God bless you guys, and uh, be praying for us here at the Ministry of Answers in Genesis, and I uh, will keep you in our prayers. We'll